Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Get your Bibles out and open up to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. This is not a, this is not a regular Christmas sermon. You know me, I, I do those once every four or five years. You know, uh, just somebody asked me, said, how do you do, what do you do at Christmas? I said, Whatever I'm preaching is what I preach on, and you know, every once in a while I actually will do a, a Christmas sermon or an Easter sermon. I'm not, I'm not a <clears throat> an event preacher. I'm just that's the way I go, so that's the way I flow. But that's how it is. Amen. Hallelujah. But this this will tie in. Amen. John ten ten. Um, Jesus is talking here and ministering and. Uh, he says here that he's talking about the sheepfold and the sheep entering in. And um, say, Actually, back at verse 7, he says, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. In other words, those who came and proclaimed that they were the door. He says, I am the door, and by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and, and, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then Jesus says this, the thief cometh not but for two. So we have, we have three things that the thief comes not but for to. In other words, the only reason the thief comes is to do this, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, and then he says this, uh, I am coming. Now this is an antithetical statement. You know, he's, his, his thesis is the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, his his ant, antithesis, antithesis, actually, uh, or antithesis, the opposite, uh, is I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the, uh, the, good, uh, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And so we have here Jesus declaring that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's come to bring life. Now the word life here is not bios, it's not biological life. He's come to give zoe, the life of God, the life of God, the life, the life that God has, the manner that God possesses it, the manner that God has it. Um, this word is used um, according to Strong's Concordance uh, of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God and through him both uh, to the hypostatic, that is the substance or essential nature of an individual, and the Christ in whom the Logos put on human nature. And that's a lot of words to say this. It's life like God has it. Okay. It's the same very life that the Father possesses. Um, you know, we've, we've discussed this in the past. The word, the word life and the word death don't mean existence or non-existence. Okay? All right? The life is what God is. It is his nature. It's his essence. It's who he is. And he has given us that life. Death is separation from God. Spiritual death. Physical death is a separation from the body. Uh, but, but life, you know, you can be... Uh, Walking in a physical body, and as we in humanity, we would consider you alive and be dead, because your spirit's not alive unto God. Okay, and so Jesus came to give us His nature, we, uh, His life. Um, uh, let's see here. Vine says it this way: It says, "Of life and the prin of, uh, as a principle, life in the absolute sense, uh, life as God has it, that which the Father has in Himself." which he gave to the incarnate son to have in himself and which the son manifested in the world. This, from this life, man has become alienated in consequence to the fall. And this life, men become uh, partakers through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who becomes its author to all who trust him and who is therefore said to be the life of the believer. Hallelujah. For it, uh, so here we are. It, this life is what we're after. This is the life. This is the life that comes from the Father that infuses us with his nature and his ability. Sister Wilkerson once said, Jean Wilkerson, the life that we are born of, this is the life that we are born of, and it is the life that must maintain us. So we're talking about this, when you get born again, when you're born again, when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're saved, you know, the terminology of you in the church, you're saved, or you're, you know, you're born again, you become a Christian. Now, we don't make, you don't get convert, converts in Christianity. 
In other words, you don't convert as a matter of, of idea or thought or, or perspective in life. You know, well, I converted to Christianity. You know, right now, I follow the teachings of Jesus. No, you've got to be born again. Jesus said, ye must be born again. Now, if you're old country folk, it's born. You must be born again. All right? And uh, I grew up country, so we, you know, you, and I've been born again. You know, well, we must be born again. Hallelujah. Uh, born from above. We have to have the nature of the Father in us. Christianity is not, it is not the application and following of theological or principled uh, religion. It must start first with the transformation of the human spirit from death unto life. In other words, in, in, the, in the human, if you're not born again, you're spiritually dead. You're alienated from the life of God. And because of the fall, that's what, that's what Vine says, this life is what we became alienated to in consequence of the fall. The fall of man brought spiritual death or spiritual separation from he who is life, the Father. All right? Jesus said in John's gospel, the 8th chapter in the 44th verse, referring to people who were... Well, look over there. Just back up. It's only a couple chapters back. You can go back to verse 41. Uh, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we would not be born of fornication, for we have one father, even God. Well, we better back up a little bit more. Look at verse 30. We'll just kind of pick up the whole, whole mindset here <clears throat> instead of just pulling out scripture. Verse 33. Um... Jesus has just got through making the statement, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He says, they, they answered him, verse 33, we be Abraham's seed and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Well, you're, you're, you're in bondage to the devil, bozo. Jesus answered said, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, I don't care what PhD, what skinny jeans, bedhead guy with high technology or somebody that's got a bunch of cool sound and tape series says, if you're in sin, that grace doesn't keep you free from sin if you're living, or if you're sinning. Grace will abound and deliver you if you'll let it. Jesus said, if you, if you, if you commit sin, you're the servant of sin. That's old covenant. I don't care what it is, it's still true. Okay? And what did he say? You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And the word, his word is the truth. We have to live according to the word. The servant abideth not in the house forever, for the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Uh, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Woo. They answered and said, we have Abraham to our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. There's that love coming out. Hear it? See, some people think that love is this mushy, gushy, get away, you do anything you want to do thing. And if you say anything, that, that's the whole mantra of the world today. If you disagree with somebody, you're some kind of phobic. All right? Hamophobic. Turkeyphobic. I mean, everything's a phobic. You know, if you disagree with somebody, you know, gluttonophobic. You can't eat all that food. Well, that's gluttony. Huh? You're hate speech. That, um, you're gluttonophobic. I mean, everything, you know, they just throw that out there. Uh, you're you know, it's, it, uh, Islamophobic. You know, they just went out to some school in, in Kentucky or Tennessee, and, you know, Virginia, up in Virginia. And the teachers had them writing in Arabic as a history lesson. There is no God but Allah. Now, had they put on there, they came in there and put in the classroom and told the kids to write, there is no God but Jesus, the ACLU and all the nutbags would be in there about to burn the school down yeah. over separation of church and state. Yeah. They had them write. Well, they didn't know what they were writing. It doesn't matter. You're indoctrinating. Right. There is no God but Allah. Okay? But I'm, a, I'm an Islamophobe because I disagree with them. Okay? Well, you know, it, it's not hate to say the truth. Amen. Okay? That's just a, that's a manipulation to keep you from saying the truth. So Jesus said, if you, were, if you were the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. But now, does this sound familiar? You seek to kill me. Say something somebody doesn't like and see how much venom you get. 
I mean, they'll come out at you and they'll call you all kinds of names and they'll call tolerance one minute and kill you the next. The same bunch was here. Same devils were running around back here. You know, different years, same devil. All right. He says, they seek to you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth, which I heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't try to kill people who told the truth. He said in verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have but one father, uh, one, one father, even God. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth from and come from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Oh boy, here we go. Y'all ready for verse 44? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinced me of sin? And I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now they turn around and tell me he has a devil. There you go. You're getting, you got a devil, because you don't, you don't agree with us. Huh. Um, so anyway, but I was after this verse 44 in particular. Jesus said, ye are, are of your father, the devil. Now you see, they thought because they were natural born Jews, they automatically had God to their father. And he says, you're Abraham's seed, but you, you know, you're not doing Abraham's works. And if you really were of Abraham, not the natural lineage, but of the spiritual lineage. It was Abraham's spiritual lineage that made him righteous with God, not, not the fact that he was naturally a Jew. Okay. The Bible says this, that the, that the New Testament, that we are the Israel of God. He is a Jew inwardly, not outwardly, um, whose circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. So Jesus establishes here that people outside the covenant of God, even if you're born a natural Jew, see, people get weirded out over the Jews. God's going to do some things with the Jews. Don't get weirded out over that whole thing. Messianic Jews. No, the Bible didn't call anybody a Messianic Jew. I ain't never seen that Bible term in the Bible. Did you, have you? As a matter of fact, the first bunch called Christian were a bunch of Jews. They didn't say you're a bunch of Messianic Jews. They said you're, Ju you're Christians. Amen. Hello? See, they, they, doesn't that sound cute, they're Messianic Jew? In other words, they don't have to name. No, they were first called Christians at Antioch. See, we don't want to think, we're going to name the name of Christ. You're not going to be ashamed of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus said, I've come that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life, have it more abundantly. He says, ye are of your father the devil. You know, you got to be born again. Why? Because Satan's your daddy. If you ain't saved, Satan's your daddy. You get, you get, oh, we're all the children of God. No, you're not. Adam fell in the Garden of Eden and passed sin on the nature of sin onto all mankind. And Jesus came. Listen, it's not, it's not like God says, you're, you're, you're of your daddy the devil and you're going to hell. He says, you're of your daddy the devil and I've come to rescue you. Yes. See, that's the gospel. The gospel is not telling people how, what truth is or reality is. The gospel is, here's the reality and here's the fix. I'm the fix. Jesus said, I'm the fix. I've come that they might have Zoe. Life, the man of the Father has it, praise God. God wants us to have that life, and it's hot in here. It is a Pentecostal service where we're preaching the flames of hell up. I knew some preachers that could, you, know, you could leave, you could smell like brimstone. I mean, they were able to pull it right up. I mean, pull the, the flames right up out of the pits. If you didn't get saved, you left singed. Praise the Lord. So, we, we need this life. This life is for us. Where does it come from? Now, we know that man is lost without God, without hope in this world. He is bound in sin. He is, he is the slave to sin. His father is the devil. Jesus came that you might have life. We know that life is the God, life that God has it, like God has it. It comes from God. The only source to this life is the Father. Amen. Through the Son, by the agent of the Holy Ghost, the Godhead has the life of God in it. Amen. John 3, 15 and 16. Y'all have heard this verse before, haven't you? 
Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Zoe. For God so loved, yeah, I know you've heard this. For God so loved the world that he gave, now the implication here or the inference here is that the world are those who are outside his covenant. Who was that? Everybody. You were lost without hope, without God in this world. All mankind, and Adam died spiritually. That was passed on generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. Got so bad one time, God wiped everybody out, but knowing his bunch. And then they went out, and as soon as they got out, they started the whole mess all over again. First thing he did was plant the vineyard and got drunk. You think, Bozo, you just saw God rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. He rode, rode around for about a year. He had all the animals on there. God sustained all those animals. Get out, get on ground, ground, land, and go out and plant a vineyard and get drunk. Are you kidding me? Why? Because the nature hadn't been changed. You see, God, God had demands, God had laws, God had dictates to humanity in the fallen state. And, by, and of course, uh, we get over to the book of Galatians and it says that the law, when God gave the law to Moses, was to show you you couldn't live like God wants you to live without being born of him. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You had to have the new birth. You had to have the nature of God inside to live out the laws of God. Amen. So if you think you're going to live them out without having Jesus on the inside, you're in a... You're, that's, it ain't going to work. That's, let me help you here. It ain't going to work. Okay? Because he even went on and said this, if you miss one of the laws, you're guilty of the whole thing. So that means, you're, well, I kept 75 of them, yeah, but the other 2,925 you missed. There's about 3,000 uh, laws or commands of the Bible. Somebody says 30,000, but I, you know, about 3,000 laws or commandments. And if you miss one of them, you get guilty of all 3,000. That's if you're trying to do it in the flesh. But if you get born again, Jesus did it for you. Hallelujah. And that is that this is where we live in, 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 in relationship to him. That if we do miss it, we got grace. We, got, we can go to the throne of grace and receive forgiveness and, uh, and receive restoration. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The purpose of the manifestation of Jesus in the earth was to fulfill the dictates and demands of God and then offer you through a relationship with him the ability to have a standing with the Father without having to keep all those laws to get that standing with the Father. It wasn't that you just weren't, you were allowed to go out and break all those laws. It was that those laws couldn't produce the relationship with the Father, and you couldn't live them without the relationship with the Father. So Jesus came to fulfill all of them and give you a relationship with the Father. And by having a relationship with the Father, you can live above the power of those laws or, or, the, or, or what those laws were against. So whatever the law told you you couldn't do, you were now empowered to live above it. <coughs> you were empowered to be free from it. Not the law. The power of the sin to hold you. What happens if I miss it? Then he made provision for forgiveness without you losing your, right, your relationship with the Father. You didn't have to lose your relationship with the Father. You could just go to the throne of grace and ask for forgiveness and get it straight. I don't care what anybody says. You've got to ask for forgiveness. Why? Because your conscience will condemn you. Don't teach people to violate the conscience that's telling them they did wrong under the guise that God's already forgiven them that it doesn't matter. That's why he said, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy in the time of need. When's your need? If you sin, you got need. So what do you do? You go with boldness. See, you don't have to go sheepishly. You don't have to go groveling. You go with boldness to the throne of grace. There is forgiveness there for you. There is restoration. There is uh, complete removal of that. But see, people try to teach everybody, oh, I don't need, you don't need to repent. You only do that if you're, if, to get saved. Once you get saved, never repent again. Really? So that means because my kids are my kids. But no matter what they do, they don't have to ever tell them, Daddy, they're sorry that they, you know, they threw a baseball through the window after I told them to stop throwing the ball at the house. Just one thing, if he's just out playing around and didn't know any better and then he threw the ball and he went through the window, it's another thing I said, don't go in the backyard and don't throw the ball up against the house. You might miss and break a window. And then next thing you hear, Pow! what were you doing? I was throwing the ball against the house. You need some forgiveness. 
after I enforce some discipline. I'm about to enforce some discipline on you over that because, you, you know. <clears throat> no, you come boldly to the throne of grace. All right, so Jesus came uh, as the only begotten of the Father. That if you believe in him, you'll not perish. You'll have everlasting life. Verse 36 of this same chapter says, He that believes on the Son has life, everlasting life, and he that believes not on the Son shall not see his life. Now, these people teach universalism that everybody's going to be saved no matter what. That's not what Jesus said. I said, that's not what Jesus said. I said, that's not what Jesus said. And I don't care if you got a PhD, an MA, a BA, an M, you know, a, 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 what, a MD, a doc, a DM, Doctorate of Ministry. I don't care if you got a Doctorate of Theology. I don't care if you have any PhDs, DDs, or everything else you can put behind your name. If you don't know, if you don't agree with what Jesus said, shut up. If you don't agree with what the Lord said, just shut up. I don't care what you've got to say. Jesus said that you know, he that believes in him has everlasting life. If you don't, you won't even see his life. Hello. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Listen to what it says here. But the wrath of God abideth on him. All right, thank you. All right, next verse. Next chapter, John 4, 14. Whoso drinks of the water I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall, um, uh, shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Verse 36, the same chapter. He that reapeth receiveth wages. He that gathereth fruit unto life eternal. And both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Um, John 5, look over there. This life comes from, the, comes from Jesus. John 5. Verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath life everlasting. Notice Jesus said you've got to believe his word. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Notice that you won't come into the condemnation if you believe on him. What does that mean? If you don't, you will. And so people who are lost without God need to find this life, and it only comes through Jesus. In John 6, 35, Jesus said, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, then he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I uh, give for the life of the world. Verse 53 and 54. Um, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, um, uh, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. He so eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. And many people got up and left. Because they didn't understand he was talking symbolically. I'm the bread of life. He's talking covenant. He's not talking about actually being cannibals. Okay. But he's talking spirit. See, you can get so messed up, and you can get so carnal, you can't understand symbolism or allegories. And then when you know, somebody comes along and shares truth with you in an allegorical manner, you get all messed up. Let me tell you, the Bible says all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. When he, you know, I mean, I, trees don't clap their hands. They don't have them. It's figurative. In other words, Jesus said if, the, if, if, if these people don't praise me and, and magnify me, then the God will raise up the rocks himself. To, to, you know, he's making, he's making an allegorical statement there. Rocks weren't really, really weren't going to praise. It was, it was you know, you, know, you, you boneheads are so hard-hearted, you won't listen. God will use some inanimate to praise me. That's what he was saying. It was, it, was, it was allegorical in that sense. Here he says, you know, if you, sit, you drink my, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, you won't have this life in you. He's talking about being a partaker of him. Remember, he's the word. He's the word. So we're to receive and partake of the word. Amen? And that word has life in it. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. And, um, and then he goes on here. Uh, we've we got a bunch of verses here we could, just, we could read. And, um, now, verse 63, right after verse 63, a bunch of them pack up and leave. And uh, then, then Peter comes up to him later on. And because uh, Jesus said, will you also go away and see? And Peter says, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then he says this. He said, uh, and we believe uh, and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Here's the thing. Peter got it. And he said, will you go away? He said, no. You're the only one that's got the words of eternal life. It is the words of God. It is the word of God that will produce in you life. Without Jesus... 
without being born again, without coming into covenant relationship with God through, through the redemptive work of Christ, you're of your father the devil. But that life has been made available to you through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Um, chapter 10, um, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then John 12, 50, I know this commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever I speak, uh, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. The words that Jesus speaks are life. Chapter 17, verse 2 and 3, and thou hast given him power over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given me. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So we get life eternal. See, what you need, everybody needs. And you know, um, I have a sermon I preach every, every once in a while when I want to do a, a Christmas sermon. I, I got a sermon I call, called The Child Grew Up. Because you see, you need to understand that the, that the birth in Bethlehem has absolutely no meaning without the cross of Golgotha and the resurrection. Hello, hallelujah. Without those events, the birth is meaningless. Okay? If we, we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be singing angels hurt, have we heard on high? We wouldn't be singing silent night, holy night. We wouldn't have nativities or nativities if you're trying to be fancy. It's a nativity. In you. T-A-V. All right? I remember the first time I heard somebody go, a nativity. I went, what? I don't call it no, no I still don't call it that. It's a nativity. Anybody, anybody kind of country enough to just go with me on that? Anybody country enough to go with me on that? Can I get a hand? Can I show of hands? Does I have anybody in this church that calls it a nativity? Raise your hand. My son-in-law? The only reason you're getting away with it is you ain't got me Burger King this morning. That the, the whole story of, of you know, uh, Mary and Joseph going and, and to be taxed and the, to give birth and the angel, all of that would have no meaning without, without the, the cross. The child grew up. So the, you know, and we, say, we talk about this in the past, how the babe in the manger, people, people don't have a problem with the babe in the manger. They, they love the Christmas story. They love the piece of it. They, they, they love the little baby in the manger because babies are innocent and babies don't, you know, they're, they're not threatening to, their, to anything. Their lifestyle, their thoughts, anything. It's a baby. But the child grew up. The child made commands. The child made statements. I've come that they might have life. My, his life, the significance of his life on the earth was so he could produce that same life that God has in you, praise God. He came to take you from the state that you are in and put God's life in you and restore you once again to a relationship with the Father that God had intended from the beginning of all creation, from the foundation of the world, praise God. He had designed all mankind to be in relationship with him. But in consequence to the fall, death passed over all man. And man became uh, subordinate to Satan and Satan became his spiritual father. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, or have it to the full. Amen. Hallelujah. First John chapter 5. This is our first John chapter 3. I'm sorry. Verse 14, 15. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Chapter 5, verse 11. 13. 11, 12, 13, and 20. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It's not in Muhammad. It's not in Buddha. It's not in Hare Krishna. It's not, you know, it's not in, uh, you know, Hinduism uh, has two million gods. Universalists, Unitarian Universalists have, when you get 13 years old, you decide what God is. And that's how you serve, that's how you live. God is dirt, therefore you worship dirt. Parents don't tell their kids what to worship. They make that own choice. Well, anyway. Sound like bozos, doesn't it? That chair is God, therefore I worship that chair. Hello? No, that life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. 
He that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And we, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. This is where we, like, we get the life from God through Jesus. That is where the life is found. You're not going to find it anywhere. You're not going to find it in Bud Weiser. You're not going to find it in uh, uh, Marijuana Lace Girl Scout Cookie Brownies in Colorado. People are dying from that kind. People are taking uh, marijuana brownies to parties and killing people. Not on purpose. Their bodies are shot from getting, eat, getting too much of, uh, of the cannabis in them. And it, it kills them. Because hey, that's cool. I got, I got marijuana brownies. Woo! Dummy. Hello? You're not going to get life there. You're not going to get life in a long neck, you know, uh, Miller. You're not going to get life in, in, in some, now some of you folks can relate to this one, some Mad Dog 2020. Now, the, some of you know what Mad Dog 2020 is. It was like, I think it was a Mogan David 2020 and some Richard's Wild Irish Rose Wine. Those are all cheap drunks, all right? They weren't even, they weren't even, they were, they were, they were classless getting drunk, you know, because it was cheap. High alcohol kind. You're not going to find life there. You might, you might uh, get yourself out of touch with everything there for a while, but you're not going to find life there. Life comes from Jesus. Hello. Comes from having a relationship with the Most High. I was telling somebody yesterday, I said, yeah, a number of years ago when I was living in Greenville, uh, and I was, I guess I was a smart aleck Christian. This guy hitchhiking, I pick him up, get him in the car, and we, we, we just get back up the road speed, and he goes, hey man, you got any reefer? No, man. I got something better. I tell you, I got something that gets you so high so quick. <laughs> I am telling you. I said, I said you, don't have, you don't have cotton mouth in the morning. You don't get depressed coming down off of it. I'm telling you. And, of course, the eyeballs have gone from just normal to about the size of, you know, like saucers in each. Boy, he's, I mean, he's over there drooling. I got to wipe to see that. But, I mean, he's just drooled all over it. I said, hey, and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. Boy, I've got him. I mean, he's just like, <laughs> give it up, man, give it up. He said, what is it? I said, it's Jesus. I'm at 55 miles an hour now. Guess what he can't do? Can't he can't get out of the car. <laughs> and that's a good way for we get stop sight or stop light. Boy, he got, he, got the, he got the gospel from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, he didn't, he didn't give his life to the Lord, but he got the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Would you call that spoiled the Christian? Uh, no. I took advantage of an opportunity to share the truth. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, he was, he was like, oh, my, man. He's like, oh, he wants that most high. He wants that high. <laughs> Explain to him that. The, the, the living a life where you got a buzz because you're not, you're not down and out. You're not defeated. You're living victoriously. You're above all the circumstances. Life only comes through Jesus Christ. It's not going to come from smoking some reefer. It's not going to come from shooting up. It's not going to come from getting drunk. It's going to come from an experience and a consistent relationship with God where he produces that life in you. Hallelujah. And brings you into the fullness of, his, fullness of his plan for your life. Now, I want you to know, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, you've never been born again, I want to tell you how much God loves you. There's a book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you're here this morning and you're not born again, I want you to know something. God's already written your name in it. Because he wrote everybody's name in the book. And the Bible says that when they open the book to bring judgment, they find those names that weren't blotted out. What do you mean? 
He gives you every chance right up to the very end to receive Jesus as your Lord. And only then does your name get blotted out of the book. His belief in you and his design for you is to come into his family and come into the fullness of his family and be part of his family and have his life in you so you can live a victorious life daily, night and day. Every, regardless of the circumstances that life throws your way, you can still have a victorious life. Amen. 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 I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Life, we have victory in life no matter what we face. I mean, the most difficult circumstances of life, the life of God in us causes us to rise above it. it. Causes us to rise up and live in victory, praise God. Hallelujah. Praise be to God forever. Our, 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 our next breath is a breath of victory. Our next day is a day of victory. Our next week is a week of victory, praise God. Why? Because the life of God in us is resurrection life, and it causes us to live victorious, praise God. It came from the Father, and God don't have any bad days, and God don't have any rainy days, and he don't have any Mondays. <clears throat> you remember? Carpenters, rainy days and Mondays always get me down. Well, everybody gets upset because they got to go back to work. You can be victorious at work. Yes. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And even when life throws a curve that you didn't see coming, and even when things happen in life you didn't expect to happen, your life is still a life of victory. Because Jesus is still Lord. Hallelujah. He's still on the throne, praise God. He's ever living to make intercession for you. He's got answers to put you as the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. You go over, you don't go under, praise God, because that life is resurrection life. And even in the midst of the worst circumstances of life, even in the midst of, of things being dead, of things going the wrong way, there is life resurrection in you that raises you up out of that and establishes you in the purposes and plans of God. Even even when they're not like you thought they would be. Life. Hallelujah. You can't not give God a circumstance he doesn't have a fix for. For your next step. Your next walk in the, in the life of God. It was supposed to be this way. But God has an answer for it not being that way. And it's victory. It's still victory. It's still victorious, Benny. It's still the life of God in you. Amen. And it's going to produce resurrection in your purposes and plans and destinies. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Amen. There's a young disciple. Actually, wrote one of the Gospels. Hanging out with Paul and Barnabas. Gets out on the mission field and, then, and apparently became a weenie. His name's Mark. You know, we got the gospel of Mark. Well, Mark was a weenie. Mark got out there in the middle of the mission field and couldn't handle the pressure and went home. And then Paul and Barnabas get back to town and get ready to go again. And Barnabas wants to take Mark with him. Paul says, he ain't coming with us. He's a weenie. Now, I'm paraphrasing. Just, okay. Weenie's not in the Bible. There's a veener in there. He's a veener. <laughs> Just say what German. Veener. All right. And the, the, the clash between Paul and Barnabas got so great. It broke up their ministry team. And Paul took Timothy, and Barnabas took Mark, and you never hear about Barnabas again. Now, I don't know that, that I don't think that means Barnabas didn't do anything. But Paul took Timothy. Why? Because the writers wrote, wrote about the, the ministry of Paul through, through the book of Acts. And Paul wrote all those epistles. But later, when Paul's beginning to write some of his closing letters as he's coming to the end of his ministry, he says, Bring Mark. Praise God. Bring Mark because he's profitable to me in the ministry. The Wiener. Wiener Mark. Not Wiener Schnitzel, Wiener Mark. The one whose ministry was dead. The one who got shunned and rejected 
later gets called back because he's profitable. God took something. And because of destiny in the life of God, I believe he took Bar used Barnabas to restore that young man. And Barnabas took him under his wings and, 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 and trained him and, and brought him up and got him ready and got him back to the point where he was profitable for the ministry. So even in the death of ministry, God resurrected it. And he became profitable to the kingdom of God. I think that's it's so beautiful. And it's just one statement because you didn't hear, you hear nothing about Mark after that. And, but until he writes a book, Clint considered one of the Gospels. So I think he got pretty well put back on the right track. But you know, life of God in us is always raising us. And let me say this, God never gets surprised by the events that happen in life. We get surprised by them. Sometimes we'll go, I didn't see that coming. I've had stuff happen. I didn't see that coming. Hello? I've had people leave sometimes. I've had, had somebody leave not all that long ago. I didn't see it coming. I know that'll never happen. That will never happen. Happened. How, how did you know? How did you figure out what's going to happen? Can I talk to you? Hang around after service. Can I talk to you? When they hang around after service, and everybody else says, can I talk to you? I usually know what that means. Usually, not always. 99.95% of the time, it means the same thing. Hello? Or can we go out to eat? Yeah. I don't do, I don't do that anymore. I don't go out to eat and get told them that you're leaving. Are you leaving? Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> you know, I'm just, uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna stuff me up for the, for the killing or something? Yeah, it's not, not into that anymore, you know. But here, Mark, his, his failure, his death of ministry was so, was so bad, it broke up the, the hottest ministry team in the world at the time, Barnabas and Paul. And they go separate ways. But God, you see, the life of God, resurrects ministries? Hello? Your destiny can, the life of God will not let your ministry or your calling or your purpose or destiny die just because there's events that take place that, that get it in a different way. I, a well-known minister, I'm not going to put it on tape because I don't want to put it on tape. Very well-known minister had a young man working in his ministry. And the, that young man's not a young man anymore. He, he, he is he's older, much older now. But at the time, he got offended about something in the ministry. Left. Went out and do his own thing. And this young man lived with the older minister for a couple of years. Stayed in his house. Something happened, got offended about. He left. Gone a couple of years or so. It's amazing how fast you find out out there you missed it. And if you're smart, you'll do something about it. Well, he came back to the, the next person down in authority in that ministry and said, is there a place for me? Well, we, we, you know, we don't have any place. Let me talk to so-and-so, the, the chief of the place. I'm trying to make this as vague as I possibly can without people figuring out exactly, but anyway. So he finally calls him in after a, little, after a little while, a week or so, and says, look, 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 we, 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 ha we have a place for you. It's not, it's not, you know, whatever, but we have a place for you. But he wants to talk to you first. So he walks into his office, and this older minister looks at the, the guy who had left the ministry, and he points his finger at him and says this, there were things I could not do because you left me. End of conversation. He's still there. He hadn't left. <laughs> the older minister's been dead now over 10 years. He hadn't left. He's still there. Because there was things he... But you know what? Now he is... He is... Of all the graduates of that school, he's probably, him and one other guy, the most too respected ever in that school with wisdom and counsel and understanding and, and ministry. He's still there now. He's still there. <laughs> I think you'd have to pry his hands off the 
door to get him out of there. Okay? And he could go anywhere in the world right now and have a successful ministry. He could travel every weekend now until Jesus comes back and have a successful ministry. But he heard those words. <laughs> I, there was things I couldn't do because you left. And God resurrected. And now he is, he's blessing thousands of ministers all the time. And Bible school students. And so where he got offended and messed up, that's death in ministry. God resurrected it. He's using it mightily. God resurrected Mark's ministry. It wasn't the same path. He, he, Mark may have, would have been the Timothy. Those letters to Timothy may have been written to Mark had he not left. We don't know. I have to believe that's what it would have, would have been. But God, Stephen, in that, God brought him back in. But your purposes and destinies in God will not fail. God has purpose. You let, let the life of God work in every area of life. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.